Good morning, folks. Hey, we're glad you're here today. I got a question for you. Any Kentucky fan? I mean, it's, it, it, it's the playoffs, right? March Madness. Any Kentucky fans in the? Uh, uh, yeah, we got one. We got the. Yeah, you were, but you're not a Kentucky fan anymore, right? Well, can well, okay, great. My, my condolences to you, Kentucky fans, and and then also I need to say we're going to have a special prayer time today at noon for Purdue University. Yeah, 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 yeah. People are going, yeah, let's pray for Purdue. Come on, come on. Uh, glad you're here today. Hey, listen, Jay mentioned in passing um, our Easter services. Easter services next Sunday are different than what we normally do anymore. Uh, Easter services are at 8 o'clock in the chapel with a traditional service. And so if you're a person who has a lot of stuff going on that day and you can't make a 915 or a 1045 service, it sounds like an 8 o'clock service would be a great service for you to go to in our chapel. Uh, this morning we had quite a few people there, and so uh, it's a well-attended service. If you want to come to that service, bring someone with you. That would be wonderful. And then also we're going to have a 915 service identical to this one here in this room, a contemporary service service in this room at 9.15. Now, normally we have a discussion service in here. That service at 9.15 will be meeting in our chapel during 9.15. And then also we have a 10.45 service here, and um, uh, we're just going to be a contemporary service as well. And uh, let me say this, if you have the opportunity, if you can do it, why don't you, if you can, come to the 9.15 service, creating more room for us in this 1045 service. Through the years, the 1045 service has always just been packed to the gills, and we could quite honestly use a few more seats in the 1045 service. And so if you have the opportunity to come to a 915, that would be wonderful. We would really appreciate that. Now let me say this. It just came to me. This is nothing planned. Sandy uh, was with some family on this last Friday. And in the time that she was with family, she got down to some brass tacks. And um, she started talking about Christ with, this, with these family members. And um, one of the things for in, in the conversation she said uh, was this. She says, I just want to make sure that you're in heaven with me. I just want to make sure you're in heaven with me. Next Sunday, we're having Easter services. Easter services and Christmas services are the services that people are most likely to come to if you ask them. And so if you ask a family member, if you ask a friend of yours, a co-worker of yours to come to an Easter service, they're more likely to say yes to that service than any other service any other time of year. Let me ask you, who is it that you want to make sure is in heaven with you for all eternity? Who is that person? Is that person a family member? Is that person, person a, a friend of yours? Maybe that person isn't a family member or necessarily a friend of yours, but maybe that person is a neighbor of yours. Do you want them in heaven with you for all eternity? I know I've got some folks that I'm going to be talking to, and I hope you have some folks that you're going to be talking to as well and bringing to our Easter services. Bring them. They'll hear about Christ. Bring them. Have a donut with them, okay? Have something to drink with them. If nothing else, hey, come to church with me. Free donuts, right? Um, we would love to have you at the services, 8 o'clock, 9.15, and then 10.45 as well. So put that on your calendar next week. Bring your friends if you can. Bring your family if you can. Eat a donut with them, and uh, we will talk about Jesus Christ uh, next Sunday. Let me ask you this. Why the cross? Why the cross? I mean, there are plenty of other... Plenty, other, plenty of other symbols for the church, but why the cross? The cross has become central to the church. I mean, we put the cross on churches. We put the cross on Bibles. We wear the cross around our necks. We put the cross on our rings. Why the cross? There are other options, right? I mean, we could have used a dove. A dove is a symbol of peace and the Holy Spirit, but no, no, we didn't choose a dove. We chose a bloodied beam of wood. Why the cross? Why the cross? 
I mean, we could have used a shepherd carrying a lamb. You can actually see a shepherd carrying a lamb as an image for the church in the catacombs in Rome. It was popular in the early church, but we chose the cross. We could have used a fish. We could have used the ichthus, if you will, but we chose the cross. We, we could have had the fish. That was a secret symbol of the early Christians. A lot of Christians used the fish way back when. In fact, did you know this? Did you know that no early Christians used the cross, used the cross as a symbol to identify the church? Not for the first 400 years of the church. And if you've ever seen a crucifixion, you would know why. It's not the type of thing that you talk about in polite company. In fact, it's rarely mentioned. Crucifixion is rarely mentioned in polite company. In fact, in early Greek literature, in early Roman literature, it's rarely mentioned there. I mean, look at the Gospels for that matter. In the Gospels, you don't go into great, they don't go into great detail about the crucifixion. And if you ever have seen a crucifixion, you would know why. You see, the cross was not a symbol of Christianity until after the Romans outlawed crucifixion. Now, there is a reason as to why the cross is our central symbol today. And if you've seen the crucifixion, you would know why. You see, the crucifixion started, the crucifixion began with a whip. It began with a whip, not the kind of whip that you see in a, in a Western movie where they, where they have a whip and they snap the whip on someone. You see, that only leaves a welt. What they used back then was called a flagellum. That's a Latin term for whip. It's a stick of about 12 inches long or so. And they tied leather strands to the end of the stick. In fact, I think we have a picture of a flagellum this morning. You see, that's a flagellum, or that is called a flagrum. It's also called a cat of nine tails. It's also called a Roman whip. And then on the end of the leather strands, they had the handle on the left-hand side, and then on the leather strands, guess what they had? They were tipped either sharp glass, they were tipped with sharp metal, they were tipped with sharp rocks, or they were tipped with the bones of animals. And the soldier's favorite, oh, the soldier's favorite was sheep knuckle bones. And after they had eaten, let's say, their lunch or their dinner, they would take the joint knuckles of a sheep and they would tie them to the ends of the leather strands of the flagellum. The knuckle bones of a sheep are sharp and heavy, and they have a tendency to break off in the wound. What they would do, they would take the victim, they would tie that victim around a pillar. They would tie them so tight as though they were hugging a pillar, and they would tie them so die, tight, it would stretch their skin out taut. And then they would tie them to the pillar naked. There would be a soldier on the right behind them. There would be a soldier on the left behind them. Each soldier had a flagellum. And each soldier, let's say the soldier on the right, he would take his flagellum and he would aim for the, for the left shoulder of the victim. And he would rear back and he would that person embedding these sharp objects into the left shoulder, and once the sharp objects were embedded into the left shoulder of the victim, then that soldier would pull down diagonally toward their right hip. The soldier on the left would have his flagellum. He would take that flagellum tipped with sharp objects, and he would embed the sharp objects into the right, soldier, right shoulder of the victim. And then once the objects were embedded into the shoulder, he would pull downward diagonally toward that victim's left hip. And just imagine, if you will, what happens over the course of 40 lashes, what happens over time with this hatch pattern on a man's back. And over half of the people who were flogged over half the people who were flogged, they died. They didn't even make it to crucifixion. And that was Jesus. They flogged Jesus. And after they flogged Jesus, then they mocked Jesus. 
Oh, they mocked Jesus. He, he claimed to be a king. And so they began, because he claimed to be a king, they began with a, with a mock coronation. They stood him up and they said, he's a king. Yeah, he is a king. We need to treat him as a king. Let's put a crown on him. And so looking around, they found a thorny bush. And they took one of the thorny vines from that bush and they, and they fashioned it into a crown very, very carefully. And once they got it into the shape of a crown to suit them, they then took that thorny crown very carefully and they jammed it onto his head. For those of you who are in health, who are in health care, you know that the head, the forehead, has lots of corpuscles. And so when they jammed that crown on his head, he was nothing more than a bloody mess. Just a bloody mess. Oh, 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 wait a minute. He's a king, right? Yeah, yeah, he's a king. We, the king needs a staff. We need to get him a staff. And so they shoved a reed into his hand. And, and then one of the higher-ranking soldiers had an old faded cape that happened to be purple. And so they draped this cape over his bloodied shoulders and his bloodied back. And then they shouted, Hail! Hail King Jesus! Hail the King of the Jews! Hail King Jesus! And then they commenced to beating Jesus. Not with an open hand, but they commenced to beating Jesus with a closed fist. Isaiah chapter 52, I believe it's verse 14. His appearance was so disfigured. It was so disfigured beyond that of a human being. He was so disfigured beyond that of a human being. In other words, if you were there and if you were to look at Jesus, you would wonder whether or not standing before you, it was a human being. You couldn't quite tell for sure. And so after they flogged Jesus, after they mocked Jesus, then they crucified Jesus. Now, traditionally, traditionally, the cross that they used was nothing more than a, than a beam, the cross beam of the cross. It's called the patibulum. And the patibulum, the cross beam of the cross, the patibulum weighed approximately 75 to 125 pounds. They put that cross on Jesus. They put the patibulum, the cross beam on Jesus. But before they put the cross beam on Jesus, do you know what they did? They ripped off. They ripped off that cape, that cape which, which had congealed with the blood on his back, the cape which had congealed with the blood on his shoulders, and they ripped the cape off of him. And it was much more, much more than even ripping off a Band-Aid. And then after they ripped the cape off, they placed this bloody beam of wood on his shoulders. And it wasn't a nice, smooth piece of wood that was finished. It was a rough-hewn piece of wood, splinters and gashes and everything else. And so they put it on his shoulders. And then after they put it on his shoulders, they began to parade Jesus throughout the city of Jerusalem. And many of the people who had hailed him as King of the Jews on Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday today, Hundreds, if not thousands of people hailed Him as King of the Jews. Some of those, many of those same people looked down their noses on Him. They rejected Him. They turned on Him. You see, for the Jews, the Messiah was to be a war hero. A war hero, not a peasant. Not a preacher of truth and justice. You see, the Messiah was supposed to be a warrior. In Jewish estimation, the Messiah was supposed to be a warrior who would destroy his enemies. And that certainly wasn't Jesus, was it? 
It was clear that Jesus had not destroyed his enemies. And the fact that he was being crucified by the Romans just proves that he was an imposter. He deserved what he got. And then as they're parading Jesus through Jerusalem, Jesus got to the point where he couldn't walk any longer with a patibulum on his shoulders. And Jesus fell to the ground. The patibulum fell off of his shoulders. There was a crowd around him watching everything that was happening. And then one of the soldiers looked at a guy and said, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you, you carry his cross. You see, the people were in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Celebrate the Passover. And one of those people who were there to celebrate the Passover, his name was Simon of Cyrene, just off the coast of North Africa. They said to Simon, you, yeah, yeah, you, you carry his cross. And so Simon took up the patibulum, the cross beam, and he carried it all the way to Golgotha. And as they were walking toward Golgotha, the women just wailed. Oh, they just wailed. And Jesus at one point said this in Luke chapter 23. He said, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Oh, no, don't weep and wail for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. In other words, in other words, the crucifixion of the Messiah will fall on you. The crucifixion of the Messiah will fall on your children. Weep for yourselves. When they got to Golgotha, they would take the crossbeam, and then they would connect it to the stipe, the vertical piece of lumber, they would connect the two together, making the strike, uh, making the cross. And once the cross was assembled, once they put the cross together, they took Jesus and they threw him down onto the cross. And then they nailed his hands and nailed his feet to the cross. And, and when you stop and think about it, it is most likely quite a bit different than what you've ever seen in the artwork today. Sandy and I were at a museum last week with some friends of ours, and we saw some paintings, some pictures, if you will. And what happened in actuality is quite a bit different than those pictures and those paintings. Most likely, they didn't put the nail through the palms of Jesus' hands because if you were to put the nail through the palms of your hands, palms of his hands, the weight of the body would most likely, well, the nails would most likely rip through the palms, would rip through the hands because of the weight of the body. Now, now you may or may not know this, the, the Romans back in the day, the Romans back in the day considered the hand, they considered the hand anywhere from the tips of the fingers all the way to the elbow. That is considered a part of the hand. And the most likely place that they put the nails into Jesus' hands, the most likely place that they put the nails in Jesus' hands, they put them in what we call today the wrist. Now, the forearm, if you're into health care, if you've ever had an anatomy class, the, for, the forearm is composed of two, two bones, the radius and the ulna. The radius and the ulna come from the elbow, and they meet right down here, right below the, the carpal bones, the, the wrist bones, if you will. And if you were to take your, take your two fingers, your thumb and, and maybe your middle finger, and if you were to feel around there, you could finally feel where they go into the carpal bones, and you'd find a, 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 a kind of a hole. And, and, and if you were to press really hard, suddenly you'd get a pain going all the way to your elbow. You have just hit the media nerve. The media nerve, if you press hard enough, goes past your elbow into your shoulder. And when they drove the nail into Jesus' hands, they drove it right there. And they went right through the media nerve. And the media nerve just sent a pain, a searing pain, past his elbow, past his shoulder, quite possibly into the middle of his back. An unbelievable amount of pain. And then they went to his feet. In art galleries today, in art galleries you see 
when Jesus is crucified, you see Jesus being crucified with one foot on top of the other. Most likely they didn't do that. Most likely they didn't do that. Now, years ago, I remember reading this in an archaeology magazine, years ago they discovered a box of bones, a stone box, not filled with bones, but a stone box, small stone box with bones in it. The bones of a guy by the name of Yohanan. And, and these bones, this ossuary, that's what they called it, an ossuary, this ossuary was, was discovered on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, just beyond the eastern gate, just beyond the Kidron Valley. They found this box of bones of Yohanan on the Mount of Olives, and among the bones in the box, they found an ankle bone. Get this, they found an ankle bone with a nail going through the ankle bone. A nail going through the ankle bone. And that's really rare, they said. That's really, really rare because what the Romans would do back then, the Romans, when they crucified somebody, and after that person was dead, the Romans would take that body down from the cross, they would take those nails out of the body, and they would use the nails again for the next victim. And so to have a nail still in the ankle bone, that was rare, and they're glad that they found that because it answered quite a bit of questions, quite a few questions. Now, this guy, Yohanan, this guy, Yohanan, was crucified on on an olive wood cross. Crucified on an olive wood cross. Now, if you know anything about olive wood, if you've read anything about olive wood, you know that olive wood is very, very dense. Very, very dense. It has a lot of knots in it as well. And if a nail were to go into the knot of olive wood, most likely that nail would not come out of that knot. In fact, the nail in the museum in Jerusalem, it still has a knot on it. The nail was driven into the knot, and the the knot is still on the nail. The nail is about four and a half inches long. Now, if Jesus were crucified like Yohanan was, They would have nailed his feet to the cross in one of two ways. Both ways, though, they would have nailed his feet to the cross independent of one another. Not one on top of the other, but independent of one another. And they may have nailed his his feet to the cross maybe on either side of the stipe side of that of that vertical beam regardless of how they nailed his feet to the cross guess what he had four major areas of pain his hands and his feet four major four major areas of pain and and you know what they they may have nailed his feet to the to the front of the cross as well that's a that's a possibility but, but they nailed his feet independent of one another. And if they mailed, nailed his feet to the sides or to the front, his body was contorted. His body was twisted. In either position, the body would be thrown forward. Leave himself of pain. He would, and, 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 and most likely Jesus convulsed after a short time, throwing his back against the rough hewn timber, his back which had just been, just been shredded, it had to have been hurting, it, nerves had to have been exposed, bones had to have been exposed, and, and, and it might not surprise you, it, 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 well it might surprise you, and you, you may or may not know this, it might surprise you that crucifixion is not immediately lethal, did you know that? Crucifixion is not immediately lethal. You don't bleed out when it comes to crucifixion. The average crucifixion, the average crucifixion did not last hours, but the average crucifixion usually lasted about three days. And Pilate was surprised when Joseph of Arimathea came to him and said, Hey, listen, can we have Jesus' body? Can we have Jesus, can we take his body down from the cross and prepare it for burial? Can we do that? And, and Pilate virtually said, wait a minute, really? Is he dead already? Is he dead already? And you know, it's not surprising that Jesus died within six hours, given the fact of how badly they beat him. Now, you've probably heard that Jesus was lashed 39 times. You see, the Jews had a law that you could not lash anyone, 
You could not strike anyone with a flagellum more than 40 times. And so what they did, they would, they would lash someone 39 times because if they miscounted and they beat and they lashed him more than 40 times, it would be breaking the law and they were not going to break the law of God. Or so they called the law of God. There was a professor at Ozark Christian College years ago who wanted to demonstrate a flogging. And so what he did in order to demonstrate this flogging was to, well, he went and bought the hide of a pig. He went and bought a pig skin. A pig skin, as you can read, is closest to our human skin. And so he bought this pig skin and he, and he tied this pig skin as tight as he could to a tree making the pigskin stretch as tight as they could get it. And then he made a flagellum. The flagellum was tipped with deer knuckles. He used deer knuckles because he couldn't get sheep knuckles. Deer knuckles were closest to sheep knuckles in texture. And after he got everything ready to go, the class was out there. He asked the class, okay, who wants to take the whip and start? Who wants to start to beat this hide first. Who wants to be first? And it was quiet. No one volunteered. It was just too close. And then, one student one male student stepped up, reluctantly so, but he stepped up, he took a flagellum, and he began to hit it. It only took him three swings before it became a contest between he and the other male students. And the professor went on to say, he said, in an instant, it became a circus. It became a circus. Who could hit the pigskin the hardest? Who could cut it the deepest? And another professor who was there said this. He said, aren't you going to stop this? He said, stop what? Stop what? The circus that just reproduced the feeling in Pilate's Praetorium? No. No. I'm not going to stop this. You see, Jesus wasn't a human being to the soldiers over 2,000 years ago. Jesus was not a human being to the soldiers. Jesus was nothing more than a thing to be toyed with. It was a contest to see who could beat him the hardest. It was a contest to see who could cut him the deepest. And that's what our Jesus went through before the cross. I mean, is it any surprise to us at all that Jesus only lasted six hours on the cross? Six hours. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. in the morning. 9 a.m. From 9 o'clock until noon, it was sunny in Jerusalem. From 9 until noon, it was sunny on Golgotha. And then the clock struck, struck 12. The clock struck 12, and from 12 o'clock all the way to 3 o'clock, it was pitch black. Have you ever been in such darkness where you cannot see the hand in front of your face? I have caving especially, you can't see the hand in front of your face. It was pitch black from noon until three o'clock. You see, here's my point. Jesus, the light of the world, died in the darkness of our sin. The light of the world died in the darkness of our sin. Do you know what Jesus said first as He hung between heaven and earth? Do you, know, do you know what He said first? He said first, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. 
You see, any Christian who is holding a grudge against another human, they need to remember the, they need to remember the contorted body of Christ on the cross because, because this is why we chose the cross for our central symbol. It's not just what He did for us, but, but, but it's what He allows us to do for others, to live a different kind of a life, a life that's willing to suffer for others. Remember, Jesus just didn't take up His cross. He just didn't take up His cross. He told you to take up your cross as well. He told me to take up my cross as well. He told us to take up our cross and follow Him. Imitating His sacrifice, imitating His suffering for others. And, 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 and with the cross... Jesus said a number of things as He hung on the cross, and one of the things that He did was this. He looked down, and, 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 and as He looked down, all of His followers were all MIA. All of His followers were MIA, MIA except for a few, of the, a few of the ladies. Jesus' mom, Mary, she was there. Mary Magdalene was there, one of Jesus' good friends. Salome was there, one of Jesus' good friends. And, and also John was there, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John was there as well. And as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he looked down and he said, John, this is your mother. Take care of your mother, John. Take care of her. And mom, mom, this is your son. Now, you know as well as I do, we've talked about this. Jesus had siblings. Mary had other children. Those children could have very well taken care of their mom. But guess what? They weren't followers of Jesus. They weren't believers until later in life. And so Jesus' dying wish was that his mom would be taken care of by another Christ follower. And according to tradition, that's exactly what happened. And what strikes me in the middle of all of this, in the, middle of, in the middle of Jesus' deepest pain, His deepest suffering, in the middle of His darkest hours on this earth, Jesus was thinking of others. Here He was being crucified. One of the most, if not the most painful way to die as he's being crucified, he's thinking of his mom. And he's also thinking about you. You. Whatever you're going through, it isn't, what, it isn't any more than what he went through. And while he was going through it, you were on his mind. And, and here's something else that Jesus said on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me, your son? Why did God turn his back on his own son? Here's the answer. <laughs> he didn't. It might surprise you. He didn't turn his back on his own son. And, and on the cross, I don't know the physics of all this, but on the cross, Jesus changed into sin itself. He changed into sin itself. Your sin and my sin is embodied in Jesus the reason it got dark is because God always turns His back on sin. Never the sinner, but He always turns His back on sin. And God punished the sin in the body of His Son so that we could go free. That's why the cross is the central symbol of Christianity. Now, now, here's something else I don't want you to miss from Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is probably the most detailed description of crucifixion of any literature of all time. 
read through Psalm 22 this afternoon. It's descriptive. Psalm 22 describes how Jesus' enemies actually surrounded Him. They surrounded Him. It tells how they gambled for His clothes. Can you imagine hanging on the cross and people gambling for your clothes? Can you imagine that? They gambled for His clothes. And it says that you can see all my bones. It says that my heart melts like wax. They've pierced my hands. They've pierced my feet. And all of this was written down. All of this was prophesied 1,000 years before it happened. And 600 years before crucifixion was even invented by the Persians. Amazing. Jesus Christ, Psalm 22. Jesus was crucified, and Psalm 22 lays it out a thousand years before he was crucified. You see, Jesus' crucifixion was not an accident. Think about it. 1,000 years before it happened, Jesus' crucifixion was not an accident. Furthermore, Jesus' crucifixion was God's plan. It was God's plan from before, according to Genesis, from before the foundations of the world. It was predicted it was God's plan. And in a sense... Your sins, your sins put Jesus on the cross. My sin, my sins put Jesus on the cross. Yeah, the Jews had a part. The Romans had a part as well. But before any other people entered the scene... God said, I choose to give my son to pay the penalty of the sins of the world. You see, when you sin, even today, when you sin, there's a penalty to be paid. When we sin, there's a penalty to be paid. And God chose to give his son's life to pay the penalty for our sin. And it was predicted 1,000 years before Jesus was crucified. It was predicted 600 years before crucifixion was even invented. Jesus willingly died for your sins and mine. Jesus willingly chose to go to the cross for you and for me. And that just simply blows my mind. He went to the cross for me, for me, for what I've done wrong. Oh, I know He came up from the grave. I know He rose from the grave. I know He walked out of the tomb. But the cross, the cross, the humiliation that He underwent, the shame that's associated with the cross, the pain, the incredible amount of pain that He had to endure. You see, the cross is a central symbol of Christianity, and what happened on the cross is the reason we have hope for eternal life. What happened there 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem is the reason we have hope for eternal life. It's the reason there's a church. And if you just can't imagine, if you can't come to grips of anyone else dying for your wrongs, if you can't come to grips with somebody else dying for your sins, Paul talks about it. He talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is what happened on the cross. This is what Paul said. He said, God made him, that would be Jesus, God made him who had no sin. He was sinless. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. For me. Why did he do that? So that, here it is, in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. So that we might become the righteousness of God. 
I look in the mirror every morning and I look at myself and I say, righteousness? Really? Righteousness? If we, were to able, if we were able to look through God's eyes for even a millisecond, we would see the miracle of the cross. Oh, the miracle. The miracle of the cross. See, the miracle of the cross is that our sins are forgiven. The miracle of the cross is that we can have eternal life. And my question for you today is this, do you have eternal life? Do you? Do you have a relationship with the one who hung on that cross? Do you have a relationship with him whereby you can have eternal life? If not, Jay talked about that foundations class we're having. If not, and you want to talk about it before then, man, we would love to talk to you about that. The miracle of the cross. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the cross. God, it sounds so weird to say that. We're grateful for that instrument of death. But God, because of that instrument of death, because of that, we can have eternal life. Because of the one who hung on the cross, we can have eternal life. Jesus, your son, willingly chose the nails. He willingly went to the cross so that we might have our sins forgiven. His body was there. He was hung on that tree. His blood poured out of His body so that our sins would be covered and paid for. And God, we thank You for Jesus. We thank You for the cross. And God, Next Sunday, we meet and we will praise and we'll thank you, not just for the cross, but for the empty tomb, because that's what we have to look forward to, eternal life. God, if there's anybody here who doesn't have eternal life, I pray that they'll say something. Come forward. I want to talk about it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.